David Chen is running for mayor of Vancouver in this year's municipal election. He represents Pro Vancouver, a new municipal party launched earlier this year. The party has candidates running for council parks and school board positions. David is a certified financial planner and has run his own business for 13 years. He was born and raised in Vancouver and holds degrees from UBC and McGill University in bio and social psychology and human physiology. He joins us today. Thank you for coming into studio. Thank you for having me. Let's start with this. Tell us why you've decided to run for mayor. Well, you know, the last three years I was a PAC chair at my kid's school in Strathcona, and it's been kind of depressing to watch kids struggling and worrying about the housing crisis because you can see that their parents are struggling and they're talking about this. And it really came down to thinking that, you know, I was born and raised here. If we don't do something, there's going to be no future for our kids. We're already at that point that even well-paid parents here are struggling. So what is the chance that housing prices are going to reconnect to local incomes? So it really came down to, in a lot of the discussions, um, I've been part of a, a talk group called Vancouver's Falling on Facebook. And we discussed a lot about how a lot of these things could actually be moderated. They could be modulated if there actually was will. But the challenge is when we see things like the upcoming uh, rezoning of Vancouver, there's no community input. There's no desire to find out what do the people need. It seems to always be focused on what is profitable for the big corporations. And I think that that's where we need to have government that actually is going to work between the two to make sure that it is beneficial to both, not just a one-sided situation. And that's what caused me to want to run because people were like, you're one of the most uh, academically you know, in tune with what's going on. You speak eloquently, you understand people, you work well with people, and that's what we need in office. It doesn't seem as if housing is necessarily an easy challenge to fix right out the gates. What is your strategy going to be if you become mayor of Vancouver? So the first thing is we want to use the powers of the province where we can actually create rental zones. So the Metro Vancouver actually did a study that said that the highest amount of speculation on land is around transit areas. And so if we were to actually change that and make it rental only, that takes away the indicator stick goes to where you need to spend your force, like your focus on trying to get speculation. Thing with speculation is like the stock market, right? Anytime you have someone bidding up a stock price, that's what creates that momentum. That's what creates this frenzy. And this is what causes the problem where a market detaches from normal, you know, metrics. And this is what's happening in Vancouver. So what we need to do is to pull it back into the normal you know range where housing has always been connected to local incomes and i found out why as a financial planner i ran the math on mortgages and basically if you put your 20 percent down you have a four percent rate of interest in a 25-year mortgage your housing price is always going to come out to about four times the average annual income of a family so we're out of that that's why we're unstable So what we need to do is to go back in there and use everything in our power to pull that back into local income ranges. So that's one aspect. Another aspect, which is being talked about a little bit by other parties, but we've also looked at, you know, how are we going to do this is with creating more of these purpose-built rentals and social housing. So we're looking at concepts, obviously, of uh, co-ops. We're looking at things that have been talked about, but have never been popular here due to some issues of the Financing Act, which again, the government can encourage banks to change. But land trusts are a fantastic idea where you have that mix between ownership, but you have controlled pricing. Um, we have to look at social housing. The definition of what is affordable has to be brought back into our zones. I mean, we had a, a report that said affordable homes or housing rent at 3702 for a three-bed bedroom apartment was affordable, that means that your income has to be well over $150,000 a year as a family. And the city of Vancouver already knows that the average income here is about 89. Why the disconnect, right? We need to bring all those forces back under control, right? So the more we can provide these alternatives for housing from the market side of things, what that does to a market is it gives people choice. Competition is always good. When you have more competition, you're going to have more chance to actually bring those market prices down. On the topic of speculation around transit corridors, it's not a secret what the region's transportation plans have been. A lot of that speculation has occurred. What ensures then that it gets built up? Well, I mean, once we've changed it to rental zoning, suddenly a lot of games have changed. 
right? If you're going in there buying cheap, thinking that I'm going to be able to upzone and find out you can't upzone, that whole game is done, right? So that will change a lot of things. The issue, though, is we see how tied our economy is to the real estate industry right now, whether it is mortgage brokers, real estate agents, construction workers. Are there not concerns about what this flattening of prices, bringing it back down to, I think, like a reasonable level, what impact that could have on the economy here in Vancouver, though? Totally. And, you know, when I'm looking at it, I have to look at it from that global perspective. So one of the things is we actually don't want a complete collapse. But what does need to happen is you essentially need a brick wall in front of the housing prices so that they're not advancing and they have a chance to reconnect to local incomes. But if you were to actually trigger a collapse without doing anything to try and prevent it, you would cause problems with all of those industries that are tied to the real estate and development industry. But that also being said, the government has a unique opportunity to help people transition out. So one of the things we have to think about, and we see this all around, is we have tremendously aging infrastructure. And that type of stuff still requires construction people. So if we were to start to siphon off people from the development industry, because if development slows down because there's no more huge profits to be made, then we would have capacity, which means we can take up that capacity. We can employ people to actually build those things that we need to, to make sure that we have solid infrastructure to meet the demands of the people and to current standards. I mean, one of the things that's still circulating in schools is lead in the water. Well, we need construction people to go deal with that, right? So that would be a way to prevent things from collapsing. But other things that we need to also think about is diversification. And we talked about that in our platform. We are very supportive of small community businesses. You know, Walmarts don't need our help. But what needs our help are the small businesses, the ones that have been there for 30, 40, 50 years, or the ones that want to be those kinds of businesses. And when we can help develop that, we create more diversification, more stability. And that is the key to preventing this whole economy from imploding in on itself. You mentioned at that start, the important relationship between real estate prices and income. And income, of course, is the important second half of the challenge that we're dealing with with affordability. Businesses struggling to retain and recruit talent. What levers can the city pull, so to speak, to try and help businesses deal with that issue? Fantastic question. So the city has really taxation at its command. So we've been looking at other models where, let's say, for example, if we were to lower the property tax, but to go for, say, 2% of gross revenue, what that does is it allows the business to better respond to their peak and low seasons, which is usually what causes a business to panic. But also by lowering that, that helps them on the overhead cost line, which means that it's easier for them to make some income. And then what we can do is because if we do that, we're now a business partner with the businesses. It is in our best interest as the municipality to drive business to them. So if their gross till take increases, our revenue increases, but they're going to be happy. They're going to be happy because the volume of their profit has gone up. It's not just a percentage issue. It's the volume. When they have a much higher volume, they can now afford to hire employees. And so that will take up some of the problem of, you know, people can't afford to work and live in Vancouver. Now, another thing that we can tweak is we can actually make it so that if you're willing as an employer to pay a living wage, which means you're going to be paying over what minimum wage is, we can structure it so that your commercial property tax would have a credit against that change. So what that means is on an accounting basis, your actual cash paid out from the business remains the same. But the difference is you've actually paid your employee a little bit more. Right. And so, again, why that's important is because the employee that's making more can afford to live in the city. The one that living in the city can afford to go to the businesses. The businesses that are thriving are paying us 2% gross revenue. This becomes a complete economic ecosystem. Think about, I guess, transportation issues going on in the city of Vancouver. It has a huge impact on the economy, uh, whether it's congestion, just getting goods and services around the city. How do we want to address that? We have different ideas being floated out there in the current municipal campaigns. What do you want to see with regards to addressing a lot of these issues that we're facing right now? Well, I think the first thing is we have to look at sort of the strategies that are being employed. Um, Right now, there's this concept within city hall planning that's called road dieting. It's designed to shrink how much capacity you have available to cars. It makes it miserable, so you don't want to bring in the car. 
But coming from a psychological background, I can guarantee you negative reinforcement is not a very popular or successful strategy. So if we look towards more positive reinforcement, how do we encourage you to come out of the vehicle? That's going to be what sticks better. So when we looked at that, that kind of uh, methodology, what we discovered was that people have three things they're looking for to make that choice between transit and their personal vehicle. One is convenience. Number two is the reliability. And number three is cost. So if it's not convenient, they're not going to use it. If it's not reliable, they're not going to use it. If it's not cheaper, they're not going to use it. And certainly if it's not faster, they're not going to use it, right? So if we can start wrapping all that in together with how we plan out transit, we're more likely to have more uptake of transit and alternative ways that are much more efficient at moving people around within the city. So when we look at that, we have to say things like, okay, what is the goal? Is it strictly mass transit where cost is not an issue, which generally is not the case? Well, if cost is the issue, now we have to start thinking about how do we create transit on a more cost-effective basis that's also convenient. So one challenge is that when we've got buses, which is actually the least costly option, they have tremendous advantages over things like LRT. LRT is on a rail. So if you have a situation where a vehicle impacts an LRT or one of the trains goes down, you have no ability to get around the thing because it's a rail system. Everything has to go on that common way. Whereas a bus can drive around, it can change its routes. But our challenge with buses on a normal usage basis is those trolley lines. You get a full bus behind an empty bus and everybody slow down because of the trolley line. So if we can get rid of that and move to hydrogen fuel cell electric buses, we now have the advantage of um, mobility in the sense that we can move around depending on what the conditions demand. We have zero emissions and we also have the convenience of rapid refueling, which is one of the weaknesses of current electric technology. So those would be some of the things that we'd like to encourage. In terms of other modes of transit, we also have to say, okay, is car share something that makes more sense? Maybe a little bit larger vehicle, right? Because People don't necessarily need vehicles all the time, right? The car shares that we have right now are based around very small family units. And we're having this wave now. I know a lot of people now that have three kids like myself, and, and that number is increasing. So we have tremendous challenges with the traditional transit, with traditional car sh share. So if we can start moving in that direction, that can change things. We also have another hiccup point, which prevents the use of all these other modes of transit, which is exemptions from child seats. So the only vehicles that currently exempt from them are taxis and transit buses or transit vehicles. So we would have to, through car share, either have the car, the car seats available or we would have to have some level of exemption if something like that is used. I mean, it makes more sense that it would probably be a ride share with someone who is licensed as a commercial driver that would be stuck to all the rules and regulations that our normal taxi industry would be to have an exemption like that. But again, the whole idea is let's have less cars coming in, less cars parking on our arteries. That's what actually allows more traffic to move through when we have less stuff that's all over the place, right? So that's what we have to look forward to. So again, you know, who knows what it ultimately comes out to. We have a bunch of ideas, but the key thing is this has got to be a positive reinforcement model. This cannot be a negative reinforcement one. And just to clarify, ride hailing does have a place in this overall transportation yes. picture? Yes. Yeah. So we looked at it and there's some challenges that the taxi industry has, and I understand they're threatened by ride share. But what we like is sort of a Las Vegas model, where what they're saying is that we have some capacity issues that the taxi industry is not satisfied. So to prove that, go down to downtown Vancouver and try and hail a taxi on a weekend. You're going to find that you have to order the taxi like two, three hours in advance, and they won't take you out of the downtown core, even though they're not supposed to say that. It's, it happens. It's been in the news. So when we look at that, we know we have a problem. So what we can do is we can bring in rideshare, but make it so that it's not going to take up the bulk of the traffic. So what Las Vegas does differently is there's bubble zones. They actually say rideshare exists, but you cannot pick up in front of a hotel, cannot pick up in front of you know a restaurant, cannot pick up in front of, say, the airport. But if you're block away, anything goes, right? So the idea is that if we have that, then the taxi industry is basically going to be unaffected. A lot of people that use taxis are for a convenience reason not because of pricing or whatever. They don't want to be picked up a block away. They just want to be picked up there, 
that's not going to change. But those that are challenged by the cost or they just want to get home. I mean, this is a huge concern as a parent and one that as a kid probably did some stupid things that, you know, we've all done. But we want to make sure that people get home safe. So, you know, when it's one or two o'clock in the morning, it would be nice to have alternate modes of getting people home. And I am guarantee you that those people would be quite happy to walk a block away from a major hotel or restaurant to pick up a ride show and make sure they can get home within, you know, 10 minutes of calling the thing instead of waiting two hours to hail a taxi. One of the big questions that we hear from a lot of businesses, though, is just the problem with industrial land. We don't have much left in Vancouver. Yes. It's evaporating as we speak. How do we tackle an issue like this where it seems as if, you know, just the, the access that we have to it, it's just dwindling right now? Yes. So if I remember the numbers correctly, I mean, Vancouver has like $5.7 billion worth of land within its land endowment. So we have to think about using that, leveraging that to our advantage. We also have to look at the nature of how the industrial land is being used, right? So there are a lot of businesses that could actually have another business above it without affecting whether that's a business office, an artist zone, whatever. But you know, there are all of the light industrial that I'm seeing is based around a one or two story concept, one story warehouse, or maybe two stories with a little business office above. So if we can look at zoning, which allows a little bit more densification, but still allows these industries to work, manufacturing still works, business offices still work, all that still works, then we can tackle this problem about the lack of industrial land, right? And that also segues into the problem with transport because transport vehicles are having tremendous difficulty moving goods around. And so we do need to respect that this is a problem, especially with diesel vehicles. The more the diesel vehicles running, the worse the emissions. So let's look at trying to make sure that we've actually got more traffic moving smoothly getting from A to B as fast as possible. We have more land that is being used to an optimal level on a light industrial kind of concept. Um, but I don't think that we, especially right now in a housing crisis, can look at housing properties and say, well, we're going to convert these into industrial. You would be elected, if elected, days after Canada legalizes recreational marijuana. Yes. What would be the strategy for handling the illegal dispensaries that currently operate in the city? So the big problem that we have is the enforcement part. So the challenge is that when we have a situation right now where fines and things from the city don't stick, that becomes very, very difficult to get people to work with us, right? Because there's not much you can do. But if we move into a zone where we can actually hit you with a fine and it's tax leanable against any property you have, well, then we've got your attention because if you don't want to comply within two years, we can take your property, right? And so that's a big part. Enforcement is key. It's not that we're against medical marijuana. It, it shows, you know, definite scientific benefits. Um, we like the, the industries that are complying, but it's the ones that are not that are problematic. And especially in that industry, because they're not running under pharmaceutical laws, which says that they have to account for every bit of marijuana coming in and going out, which now opens up the possibility for having illegal marijuana coming into the system. And I've talked to users and I've asked them, are you concerned about where you're getting your marijuana from? I mean, you might like your local dispensary, but if there's no control and it's coming from a gang source, a gang that might have actually done some bad things to people, how do you feel about that? And they actually don't want marijuana to come from those sources. So I think that we are required as the governance to step in and enforce and promote the proper use of dispensaries and the proper operation of them and to try and deter those that want to bypass the law. David, I, I look at some of the other people running for mayor, and it might be easy for me to figure out based on their political past, you know, where they fall on the spectrum. You've, you're pro Vancouver's calling itself kind of nonpartisan or, or centrist, but yes. I mean, can you give us an idea where you fall as mayor? People do yeah. want to have an idea about where somebody is going to be coming from. It's a fantastic question. The, the challenge is that historically people look at political spectrums and they peg you at certain points. But I can say, I can challenge that idea because the average person doesn't think that way, right? Tyler, if I say, you know, when you're at home and you're making a decision, do I want to go out tonight or whatever, do you think where you are in the political spectrum? Not often. Absolutely. <laughs> Nobody does, right? So why are we so pegged on where are you in the political spectrum? But what we can recognize is good governance doesn't have to be politically pegged. It can actually look at a problem. We are a social democratic society and we can say, you know, we have people that need our help. 
but we also have to pay for that. So we need capitalistic you know, economic engines running in order to create the tax revenue in order to do this. But they have to be in balance. So really the fastest way to explain who we are is we're not really centrist. We are taking positions on both sides, but we're moderating and we're balancing. And when you take those positions and you average it out, then yes, we're in the center. Okay, fair enough. Fair enough. Is there anything, David, you would undo? A policy, a tax that's in place that the current government imposed that you would you would reverse? Um, well, the first thing I would do is I would say parking tolls are a tax. They're a tax on people that want to come into the city or even if it's residents trying to go downtown or wherever to enjoy a night on the town with their families. So the first thing is to get rid of all parking tolls after six o'clock. But what I would say is let's modify it. Let's e- actually improve even the daytime parking hours. Let's make it so that because we've got technology now and smartphone apps and paying those tolls with that is picking up. We can actually make it so that if you were to actually park and pay a toll, go into a vendor nearby, pay for something, patronize them, which is profitable for the city, for the vendor, you get a QR code that now refunds your parking. Wouldn't that be a fantastic idea? Final word, what's your pitch in the seconds we have left to business leaders, entrepreneurs, business owners in terms of why they should vote for you and Pro Vancouver? What we're all about is my background is I'm a financial planner. I've also been an entrepreneur mentor for six years. So what I understand is what business people need, especially when they're more in the startup mode. And that's where it's going to help because we have a lot of people that need to replace the old generations of businesses and they're having tremendous difficulty right now. So to have someone that's in your court that understands what you're going through, but also knows what you need and how to promote those things that you need, I think that's a very valuable asset to have working with you, right? And I always say this, at the end of the day, we are responsible to the residents and the business owners. They are actually the boss. What we are is the people making the decisions to connect the dots and to help them out. David, thanks so much for joining us and best of luck with your campaign. Thank you so much. That's David Chen, candidate running for mayor of Vancouver, representing Pro Vancouver. And that's it for our show. Thanks for listening to BIV Today. You can find us on iTunes, Stitchers, or go to BIV.com where you can find even more of our stories. And join us tomorrow as we continue our coverage of Vancouver's mayoral race.